Okay, well, I think we're live. Thanks very much for tuning in to today's webinar on exchanging data between CAD and GIS systems. And uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Yes. My name is Dale Lutz. I'm the co-founder and VP of product development here at SAFE, and I'm joined by... Mark Island. Now, Mark, um, you're the evangelist here at SAFE. How many years have you been at SAFE? Um, seven. We eight. didn't rehearse this. So, <laughs> a long time. Um, prior to that, Mark actually was a CAD guy, I know. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, bring a, CAD, yeah. you bring a, a wealth of, of experience. And now this mustache I see there, that isn't the normal way that you look, is that right? Or what's the deal there? Well, that's part of the Movember. I see. Because my whole staff here seems to look a lot like a bunch of the characters out of the Starsky and Hutch TV series uh, this, this month. And um, those of you that are too young to know what the Starsky and Hutch TV series is about, you can tune into the movie to get an idea. But um, I'll just call you Huggy Bear during the thing today, Mark, and uh, we'll go with that. Well, a colleague told me we, uh, we all look like 70s Australian cricket players, if that, <laughs> if that makes any sense to anyone out there. Okay. Well, that's pretty good, too. So. Okay. And so we, we have a giveaway later, don't we? It's um, 20 seats up for grab in our FME desktop online training, December the 13th and 14th. So. Something to do just before Christmas? Yeah. Nice uh, sort of Christmas getaway thing. Now, Mark is too, uh, too um, modest to say, but, but he is the author of, these, of this training uh, course, and it is really, really fantastically done and well worthwhile. So please watch for that at the end, and uh, if you're able to, to take it, uh, we would absolutely welcome you. Welcome you there. Absolutely. Are you going to be teaching that one? Do you know? I don't know. It's it's always a bit of a nobody knows until the yeah. middle of the day. It's exciting. It, online's not quite as good. It used to be you could go somewhere for a trip in December and get your Christmas shopping in. But, uh, right. I know that you're a big St. Louis fan, Mark, and uh, <laughs> and, so, and so some of those exotic locations. But now we just do it from the comfort of our yes. offices here That's in Surrey. Right. Yes. So who is Safe Software? Well. Um, there's about 90 some of us uh, look like we all have iPad, iPods um, there and uh, having some fun here in Vancouver. We're not really in Vancouver, we're in the suburbs of beautiful Surrey, British Columbia where we just had an election and returned our mayor with one of the highest margins anywhere um, at all. So we're very pleased with our mayor here in Surrey. And we have thousands of happy customers all around the world. There's trainers all over, uh, lots of systems integrators that use our stuff. And um, really, uh, just about everywhere other than the axis of evil countries. So um, that gives us a, a global footprint, and, um, and we have a lot of fun working with people from all over. So I think we wanted to start this morning by asking just a few things about yourselves out there to help us as we um, go through the, the webinar this morning, where we're going to be looking more closely at how you can use different technology to help with CAD and GIS. And so, Mark, what's the first poll? The poll is, uh, have you used FME before? So we're just talking about a mayor's election. Um, the turnout in those mayor's elections was about like 30%. So we're hoping for a little better. Oh, we already passed that. We got about 50% uh, turnout, so that's pretty good. Okay. So this will give us an idea of where we can pitch today's, um, today's webinar. So it's basically a pretty well uh, distributed group. So we got 70, 80%. Yeah. We'll go a few more seconds to get their answers in. Um, thanks so much for, for taking part. But it uh, looks like a pretty interesting group. Well, let's, let's share those results somehow. Is that showing up for people? Yes, Let me just check. It should be. There it is. Wow. So um, a lot of you that haven't used FME, so we will uh, make sure to explain to you what's going on as, as we're going through that. And um, all the way down to a few of you that have been using FME for a long time, and we're honored that you're taking the time to tune in and hope you can pick up some new things today. Yeah. And another couple of quick questions. Yes, just to get to know you better, what, uh, what type of CAD systems are you typically working with? And so uh, you can see there we're looking at the various AutoCAD products, Autodesk product line, and MicroStation. And of course, you can write in some um, or let us know if there's others. And uh, maybe just type them in in the chat if you have sure, yeah. others. Speaking of the chat, we actually didn't mention that we have a whole panel of experts standing by to answer questions today. So make right. them sweat. So I'll just introduce a few of them. Mark Stokes, head of our professional services. Laura Kersens has been with us for quite some time uh, as well. And over in other rooms that I can't see, I believe Robin Rennie and Dan Eisminger are there. Yeah. So we need to have a lot of people on standby when we do a, a webinar, obviously. <laughs> yes, we got because we can get uh, 
overwhelmed with the questions and we just love that and if we can't answer your questions today we'll be sure to uh, to get back to you in the next couple of days uh, at the longest if some of you ask some really tough ones like how do you set the high bit of the bounding box Z in a microstation version 7 file um, that's a little bit of specialized knowledge but we can answer that actually uh -huh. if uh, oh, you can like. yeah. <laughs> so um, about 71 percent AutoCAD 47 Microstations. So I bet all these people are um, taking this just to kind of as a warm-up exercise before going to Autodesk University uh, in about oh, okay. a week's time. And actually, while we're talking about that, uh, SAFE will be at Autodesk University. I'm uh, boarding a plane and heading to Vegas. It's all work uh, that's going to go on there. And actually, I'm giving a talk. So if any of you are interested in that, um, check me out in the program. I believe it's on the Wednesday. And it's about using FDO inside of MAP 3D. So I um, okay. hope to see. And we have a booth there too, so please stop by if you're at Autodesk University. So I just popped up the other poll question, the last one we've got. Um, which direction are you translating data, CAD to GIS or the reverse? Looks like a lot of people are going both ways. Yes. So Mark, I'm hoping, do you have demos that go both ways today? I do. Well, that's, that's fortunate. Fortunately, I have demos of both AutoCAD and MicroStation. So um, that's we'll, great. We'll see quite a bit. And in fact, actually, um, I've, I've been told that this, for those that don't know, um, we have actually done this webinar once before, but this is an all revised one. Mark has uh, spiffed it up, and it's got like um, not more cowbell, but more DWG. Is that right? That's right. Yes. So, if, so uh, the 71% uh, out there, not the 99%, the 71% uh -huh. um, will be pleased to know that, uh, that we're going to be showing some DWG. So, what do we have for results there? They were up there and we showed oh, it. I, I think I shared them, yes. So okay. 60% both directions, 32% uh, CAD to GIS. So, and yeah, no, no, over 90% of people are doing CAD to GIS here. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and what about, about 68 or 70% going yeah. back the other way? So, this really proves something that we've thought it's safe for a long time is that the data flows both directions. Yes. It's not like people are abandoning CAD and moving to GIS. It's the data's moving every which way. Yes. And so, we have this slide here that just says, hey, translating between CAD and GIS can be a pain in the neck. Yes, and of course, all the issues, uh, the, the mismatches between the way that you think about data in CAD versus the way you think about data in GIS, they come to a head when you're doing this data exchange. And so actually, SAFE started back in 93, really um, somewhat accidentally to tackle this problem. Our, our first customers were British Columbia government. They were using MicroStation heavily and some AutoCAD um, and they wanted to move stuff in and out of a GIS standard called SAFE, S-A-I-F, and that's where this, uh, where our company name actually came from. And it was a pain in the neck back in 93 and um, we've been trying to soothe that pain all this time. You can view this as really like having a massage today. That's right. Um, and so that, I guess, is about the ability to, uh, to transform and translate data so we can convert between lots of hundreds of different formats. I think 285, is that right? Yes, it's something like that. It's actually, ironically, become very hard to actually say the exact number of formats because there's a lot of third parties that have written formats that we don't even know about or count. But today we're going to be talking about CAD and GIS, really those two bubbles, um, just two of what the eight or ten bubbles on this diagram. Uh, for those that are interested or you have other data types you work with, like 3D data or maybe point clouds, LiDAR files, raster, um, any number of databases, FME can do all those things. And uh, if you really are enthused, you can look at our uh, webinar archive, would have more yeah. material on that. But today we're going to be focusing on how you can use the technology of FME to speed and smooth the flow of data between CAD and GIS. Yeah, that's right. And we're going to look at converting formats and also doing data transformations just to because there's quite a lot of transformation sometimes you need to get the data in the right format to get it into the CAD or That's right. I mean, the sad thing is a lot of folks, when they think about FME and SAFE software, they just think of us as format people. But if they think of us as format people, they're really leaving, I would argue, 80% of the value on the table. Yeah. And today you'll get a chance to see uh, what kind of things you can do while you're moving data between different formats and systems. And that's honestly where the real value is, the goal being that by the time you get into your GIS or your CAD system, the data is absolutely ready to be used. So today, yeah, we're going to be looking at CAD to GIS, first thing. Uh, that's then a warm-up? Yes. And then we'll look at some data transformation, um, a little bit more data transformation, 
we'll do some GIS to CAD, uh, and then we'll start looking at templates as well. Now, Mark, the rumor was that you were actually going to run this using the FME 2012 beta, is that right? That's right, yeah. So for those that aren't aware, SAFE is on an annual release cycle, so um, I'm listening to the Steve Jobs biography, and in there he says, real artists ship. And uh, SAFE must uh, have real artists that ship not only once, but every year in January we ship a new FME. If you buy FME tomorrow morning, you get FME 2011, but yes, you do get FME 2012 as well. You always get the next release whenever you buy, and you can try it out if you want to. Um, you can go to safe.com slash beta at any time and pull that down. We make it available at all times. Absolutely. So we'll start out with looking at some um, CAD to GIS. Um, the first thing I wanted to look at was the FME Universal Viewer. Um, our FME product is a, is a suite of applications, I guess you can say, and we have a number of different um, applications, one of which is the FME Universal Viewer. And the Viewer is basically a tool for looking at data. Um, well, uh, really, what in, inspecting data, I guess. We'd right, call because it. we like to say it's safe that we're at the part of the food chain where we're always to blame, and so the the viewer lets us get off the hook by finding out what the data is before and after we get involved. Yes. So um, initially, when we made FME, we didn't have the viewer there, but uh, we began to realize that people need a way of seeing whatever it is they're starting with. So it really, it actually adds quite a bit of value, even even just there. So that's what I'm looking right now. I'm just opening up a DWG file to, uh, to take a look at it. So we specify the format, we specify what the data set's going to be. I can click on the button and choose some parameters to have a look at as well. So like you can see there, expanding blocks and user coordinate systems and, and if you're going to scan the data for attributes or not, lots of interesting things. Yes, and you can apply world files and paper space and uh, all of that sort of thing. All right. So you're going to bring up one there? So yeah, so we're just going to bring up a, a basic DWG. It's a set of water data. Uh, we'll, we'll just zoom in a little way. Uh, oh wow, there's lots of labels and things in there. Yes. So we've got pipelines, we've got nodes at the end of the pipes, and we have those labels are water meters, I believe. So Mark, you can show the folks, I know I'm deviating, but under the view menu, if we want to see where that text is actually inserted, we can go under options and mark the text where to see that. Yes. Because one of the things we often, in, in these kinds of problems, you really want to know what in the world is actually going on yes. there. And we can query all of these as well. So we've got this information. Oh, yes, yeah. it's in the, um, in the uh, information window. We can see all the extended entity data that's uh, attached to this. So all that stuff is available to us when we actually go to do a translation. In, in this case, probably, I suspect, you're going to go into a GIS. That's right, yes. We, we're going to go to... Um, Geodatabase. Okay. Anyway, so I mean, just to look at the viewer a bit further, we can add some more data to this, and this is one of the nice things that we sometimes forget about that the viewer does. Really, it opens up lots of different data sets, lots of different formats, all at the same time. So I can open up, for example, some MIF data, uh, map info format. Um, let's see, we got properties. It was parcel M25, I think we picked. And what if you wanted to do two of them? Can you? Oh, yeah, I just pick more than one. You can pick several all at once. I yeah, bet you can. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So um, I'm just going to open M25 for now. Because it would overlay this other one. Yes. And plus, you're British, and M25 must be a name of a famous motorway. It is, yes. Anyone um, in Britain is probably um, stuck on the M25 <laughs> right now. They're no dialed in. They're it. dialed yes. in uh, listening. Yes. So. Um, yeah, we've got some CAD data, we've got some GIS data on there. We can also add some raster data as a backdrop. Wow. So I'm going to add some Ooh, Mr. Some Mr. Sid. Sid. Yep. I know uh, last time folks asked, can we write to Mr. Sid? The answer is no, we can't write to Mr. Sid, but darn it, we can read it. Um, we can write to ECW and JPEG 2000 and all kinds of things, but to write to Mr. Sid, you do have to buy the Lizard Tech uh, tool. So, whoa, you're yes. picking four there? I'm picking four there. Okay. I think I remember now that there's four. So what happened was that popped up on top. We can just drag it down to the bottom. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, Maybe. It should be. It's well, zoom to extents. Well, OK, there, there we, we go. go. Well, we were in the wrong spot. That's yes. why. So we can see that. And one thing I can perhaps do is change the parcel data to be a different color, just to make it easier to see. OK. So we can change colors. We can query. You can even click on pixels, I think, and stuff starts to happen, right? Yes, yeah, so yeah. we can click on the Mr. Sid and find out what the cell values are for that particular pixel. 
Okay, and it's the red, green, and blue. FME can handle all kinds of rasters. Um, we actually do a, a talk once in a while. I think there's even a webinar canned about FME and rasters is, for yes. those that are interested. Um, but we can do clipping and um, reprojection, that sort of stuff, along with a lot of high-end things there. Okay, so that was just to show you one of the applications we have with FME. And, and now what we'll do is we'll start up um, a product called Workbench because we want to uh, translate some data. I guess now that we know what the data is we're working with, we're going to go and set up a trans translation. So what, what kind of formats are you going to be working with? Um, we're going to be going with that same PWG wa uh, water tile. But what we're going to do is convert that to your database. Oh, wow. So we're going so you've got ArcGIS there. on this box? Um, yeah, yes, I do. Wow. Yes. Okay. So let's find that data again. Data, water, M25. Check the parameters and set. So the attribute schema thing is going to cause it to try to fish through that extended entity data and actually guess at what the schema really is. Yes. So we're going to use the uh, the Arc Objects API. We do have the because uh, you've the got Arc ArcGIS licensed on here. Yes. If you don't, you could have used the File Geo Database API. I believe so. Yes. That's new in FME 2012. Yes. There's a couple of um, geometries I don't think that supports yet, like text. So. Uh, right. The so annotation isn't. Because yeah. you're going for annotation here, are you? That's right. Okay. Yes. So I'm just going to click OK, and um, Nothing. Basically, basically we're scanning the schema right now. Right. So that's what that told us. And now you get to decide which things do you want to bring in. Yeah. So I'm just going to click OK, and that is oh. our translation. And so um, the nodes uh, layer, it's got points and it's got line features on there. And because you can't have a single table in GeoDatabase, it's got points and lines. Uh, what FME's done is it's thrown this, what we call transformer, in there to make sure that data gets separated out. Right, so basically there's two different, if we um, hover over these things, maybe we can see the tooltip will tell us. Yeah, yeah. that one says lines. Got it. And in fact, what I'm going to do, because I don't really want the lines, one of the things I can do is disable that. Okay. So and, it, and again, what, one of the things I say in training is whatever I show is just an example you might want to do something completely different, turn other things on and off, add different data, but this is just an example. Right, it's a pretty free-form environment where really the only limit is your imagination. Yes, absolutely. So we've got a little green... Oh, well, you're running it already. Button, so I'm just going to hit run. Okay. And, uh, see how long that takes. It should be about 10 seconds or so, I think. Okay, there's nothing quite as exciting as a log file going by. Nothing more um, nerve-wracking during a live webinar, that's for sure. <laughs> there it goes. So there we go. And nothing as happy as seeing translation yes. was successful. You know, we used to print that message twice just to drive home the point. Okay. But so I see that we only do it we once. We wrote 3,300 features to a, to a geodatabase. And so now what we can do is I can, I've got our map open already. Let's go and have a look, see if I can find that uh, water data. I think I called the, uh, the database water. And so, yeah, okay, so we've got yeah. the distribution lines. We've got the, the nodes okay. and the meters as well. And the meters should come in as annotation, text, sure annotation as before. All right. So now what are you going to do? I'll just zoom in just to prove that it is all um, where it was and we can query things and that information's come through. Right. Um, so yeah, so I mean that's, and, and really um, FME is as simple as that I think. It, it's just very, um, very easy, um, quick to do translations. Okay, so I'm just going to exit out of uh, ArcMap, just so I don't lock the table while I'm uh, while I want to try and write to it again. Okay, so that was just a quick uh, demonstration of data translation. What we're going to do now is a bit more transformation and actually do something to that data uh, while it's being translated. Um, one of the things I can do, for example, is we can look at the uh, the attributes that appear on the uh, distribution pipeline to say, well, look, let's try and rename one of these, like year insta. Let's try and rename that one. So I can right-click and rename this attribute to um, installation date. Ah. So I can just rename something like that, uh, and that's very simple. One other thing I can do with FME, um, again, this is just an example of what you can do, is I can open up this dialog box, um, put a tick in here, choose uh, diameter. And what this is going to do, it's going to write the output out to a separate table for each different diameter of pipeline. Wow. It's what we call a fan out. Um, 
and and I mean I, w I wish I just had that um, capability when I when I used to work with MicroStation because you had to put a fence around everything you do FF equals and you write a file name and then you turn the layer off and on again and it was very difficult to split a file up whereas with this we can do it very quickly uh, just with that single setting right there goes all those things underscore four and sixteen yes. and stuff yeah yes yeah, so that's a little bit different at the bottom of the log file now it's actually written a different bunch of tables uh, according to the um, the size of the pipe so we're going to start up ArcGIS again um, just to prove that worked so of course you could we just used diameter that came from the original input file but you could always glue together some combination of, of That's things right. or yes. you could say diameter underscore there's there's tools for doing that yes. and so we have the water there we'll just well there you go you can see all the different tables we have now so we've got the eight inch table okay we can query that um, if I and you'd hope the diameter would be eight yes you would certainly expect that to be the case yep it is so, so that there the, we go. There's consistency in the universe. So yes, yeah, so now we've got a different table for every different diameter, and I think uh, we, well, we should have noticed. I didn't um, point it out that the uh, the attribute actually did get changed to installation date instead yes. of date. A little bit of bad data there, it looks like. Yes, it doesn't have a date, but um, yeah, I guess date is not perfect that we're working with. Is that right? There's data that isn't perfect out there. Apparently, yeah. Wow, even in our demos. Yeah, I guess that's more realistic. It is, yes. Okay, so I'm going to shut down uh, this, and let's have a look now at a different um, example that I'm going to show. Um, again, it's going to be a, I'm not going to save that translation. Again, it's going to be a trans uh, transformation, also a translation. We're going to convert from DGN format. So what the first thing we would normally do is um, open up a data set in the viewer just to take a look at it and find out what it is. So we're going to look at the water data, and we've got DGN files in here, wastewater, M25. I'm not overlaying it on top of the existing data now. I'm opening up a new view. Okay. Um, and we can see it's got various colors in there. Um, if I oh, zoom yeah. in, um, yeah, they, they should be the colors that uh, appear on the, um, the features in, in MicroStation. And so if we look at this, you can see, well, I, I query a feature, but it doesn't actually have any um, attributes on it. Um, the the information about diameter is actually a label uh, on the same layer uh, or level of data. Um, so the challenge we've got here is how do we get that information? How do we take that annotation um, and use that number as the diameter number uh, in our GIS data set? So what I've got is just um, a workspace here that I created earlier just to shave a few seconds off the demo. Um, it's reading from MicroStation. It's writing to um, a map info format. So what we're going to do now is start adding um, these transformers manually. So the example we did before, we, we generally call that um, schema um, editing, structural transformation, really, because we changed the structure of the data. We didn't really change the content of it so much. Whereas now what we're trying to do here is we're trying to change the, uh, the actual content of the data um, as well. Okay, so we, we have these objects called transformers, which we use to do this. And I can just type in the name of a transformer to add it in here, and it's a geometry filter. So this is the one that FME added automatically before. This time I'm adding it manually uh, because I, I want to use it in my workspace. The other transformer I want to use is what we call a neighbor finder transformer. So we're going to go neighbor finder. Um, if you've used FME before, you'll notice in 2012 we now have Neighbor Finder with a U as well and without a U. That's for our folks that are stuck in the M25? That's right, yes. So they can now pick Neighbor Finder and they can type in the, the Queen's English and get the proper results. <laughs> so we are going to connect that up. But they don't get a day off um, on Thursday, those people, for Thanksgiving. No, that's true. But neither do we because we're in Canada. So. <laughs> That's true, but we can type it either which way. Okay. So what I'm going to do with this transformer is connect up the information. So we split the data up into different geometry types. The lines are going to be the base, and the text features are going to be the candidate. In other words, try and find the nearest piece of text to each line. There's help for all these that tell you what those things Absolutely, do, right? Absolutely, yeah. yes. 
And a lot of what I'm going through is, is fairly quick, just for time reasons, yes. but we go into this in a lot more detail <clears> in the training course. So if there's anything I'm not really covering, it will be covered in more depth there. So the trick really to using FME productively and getting the power out is understanding these transformers and how That's you can right. chain them together in interesting yes. ways. And so a transformer has parameters in the same way that the readers and the writers do. Right. And what I'm doing here is setting a parameter for the neighbor finder to say, search to a maximum distance of 50 units, which in this case is feet, and, um, and don't find anything after that point. And the other thing you might notice for 2012, if you used FME, is we have this parallel processing oh. um, option going on. But we won't be using that today. That lets you make use of multiple cores, I guess, if you've got them on your computer that's to right. get more performance up. But that's part of the FME 2012 release. Yes, that's right. OK, so we've got that. So I'm going to just drag this connection across here, because we want the output to be anything that's matched. And I'm quite obsessive for having lines straight. <laughs> within a workspace, so I'm just going to line everything up. Some people don't mind. I must be obsessive compulsive, it drives me mad if that's not the case. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do? We are going to run this, I think. Oh, no, a couple of things first, actually. We've, the attributes we've got coming out of the, uh, the neighbor finder, because what we've done is we've, we've said, well, which is the nearest annotation? Yes. And this annotation information is held in an attribute called IGDS text string. Right, uh, the label itself. Yes, and this is um, uh, an attribute that FME creates by itself. Um, so we can make use of that. So we'll, look, that information needs to go into this output schema. Yes. To the pipe diameter yes. attribute. And the other thing we're going to do here is I'm going to copy this other attribute that FME creates called IGDS color. It records the color of the feature as it was originally, and I'm putting it into an attribute called original color. Right. And that, sorry, Dale. You... Well, I was going to say that, that that's just the index number in the, in the right. design file lookup. So it's not an RGB. No. It's like 16, because a lot of times people use those to mean something more than just the color. Yes. And so the reason we're doing that is just because, well, as you say, it, it sometimes has a meaning. Um, the other thing is you might want to translate the data back again. Ah, and yes. If we've got recorded color, then it helps. You can tuck it away to yes, bring it back. Yes, especially when you're writing to a format that doesn't support color, like um, say an Oracle database, right. I don't think. Yeah. So, so we can do that. Um, the other thing we might want to do is we say, well, look, we're writing to map info. Can I write to something else at the same time? And for sure we can do that. We can just say, let's add another writer in here. And we're going to write to KML format. Oh, wow. And we'll just call it water.kml. So you can output to two different things. And I suppose you can route anything you want That's to right. either of them. They don't have That's to right. be um, like a mirror of each other. So. That's right. But now it's asking me, well, do you want to add a new layer to this data? Well, yes, otherwise it wouldn't be much point. We'll call it water. And again, I'm running through this pretty quickly, but I'm just adding an attribute here with the same name. Uh, which would be uh, pipe diameter or something like that. Sure. And we're going to connect that up. So you can see we're making duplicate connections there, and um, that means we're going to get a duplicate data. So we're going to data into Map Info, and we're going to get the data uh, written out to Google Earth. Now, did you set the coordinate system? I didn't, but um, all of the um, the DGN files have got uh, world files included, or ah. PRJ files. Now, a lot of the people at home won't have coordinate systems with their CAD files, and a lot of times that's a challenge, so you have to set that up manually. Yes. But, um, but this data was good enough that it must have a .prj or something sitting there. Yes, so if we look in the world ah. folder, they've all got .prjs uh, to go with it. Yes. So um, we're, uh, we're good there. Yes, OK. So we, we've got that information. So it should run OK, and it did run OK. And the reason I bring that up is that KML requires to know where stuff is on the Earth. You can That's get right. away without knowing the coordinate system with a lot of other systems, but not with Google Earth. That's right. It, uh, it, it wouldn't be happy about that. So we're going to fire up Google Earth and hope that it, um, it plays nicely today and isn't too low. And I'm going to open up that data. You can tell I was practicing because it's opening up in the same window. John Calkins would be proud of you. There we go. So you can see there we've got all that information in here, and we can query a feature, and it will tell us the pipe diameter. Oh, wow. So, so automatically it made a bubble like that. Yes. Now, if you are a KML uh, wizard, 
you can use FME to pull all the KML levers. And in fact, we have a whole webinar on that. Mm -hmm. um, you can make these bubbles, for example, include pictures and probably dancing people and everything else. Yes. So out of the box, though, it gives you this table. Yes. So, and you can see the colors came through as well. So we've got the pink, the blues, the cyan. Uh, there's a green one in there it's, as well. It's a beautiful it's green. It's difficult to see, uh, but it, it is there. Yeah. So by default, when you translate to from a CAD system to a GIS, we will transform the color. And if, take that. If, if the destination knows what to do with it. That's right. And it doesn't always uh, have Shape files, for example, yes. don't. So. And you get similar issues with um, some geometries like arc features, like, right. a, like an arc. In a, in a CAD file wouldn't be understood if you wrote the shape. Yes. So um, we would turn that into a line feature. We wouldn't drop that feature. We, we try and keep We'd it. We'd stroke it out. Yes. And, uh, you know, we have this, uh, it's an add-on into FME called the curve fitter that'll put the arcs back in. Yes. If you If you have data that's made a trip through shape files, but you really love your arcs, you can get them back again later. Yes. Okay, so I'll shut down Google Earth. Worked fine. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy. Okay, so that was <clears throat> excuse me, an example of doing CAD to GIS translation. So we did two of those. We did a bit of uh, transformation on them as well. Yes. Um, so what we're going to look at now is going the other direction and doing GIS to CAD. Uh, because obviously you want to be able to do things like create cells, create blocks, and all of that. Um, Maybe, yes, yeah, setting so, colors. And yes. Because the CAD people have some expectation that when they get it, it's going to look nice. Right, yes. And, and we can basically do that. With See, the GIS people expect attributes. The CAD people expect it to look right. Yes. So uh, so what are we going to translate? We're going to translate the shape um, here. And I've got a data set. Um, it's from the Vancouver oh, area. I could, I'm, I'm suppressing the desire to make Occupy jokes here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are looking at parks and uh, <laughs> dog off-leash areas. We should look at camping sites as well. <laughs> So we picked two shape files there that we're going to read, and we are going to write out to, um, I'm going to go to MicroStation to start off with. Go for V8? Yes. All right. And we are going to write it to parks, if I can spell, dot DGN. Right. Okay. Okay, and we've got parameters as well. Um, we can say, well, look, what seed file do you want to set on your output? What cell library do you want to use? What are the output units, master units, subunits, units of resolution, do you want area fills and that sort of thing. So I'm going to change the seed file. That for me comes with a bunch of default seed files. And we're going to be in meters, but I want to make it 2D, not 3D. So we're going 2D meters to, to V8. Uh, and that's going to be the seed file we're using there. Uh, we've got a cell library because I'm going to be writing some cells. So we're going to select this. And again, FME's got some default cell libraries. I'm not going to use those today. Um, I'm going to use um, one that I made up especially for this um, uh, translation, the Park Cell Library. And if you're an AutoCAD user, don't worry. We'll we'll get onto that in a second. It's very much the same technique, but um, but we'll show that as well. So don't don't worry. Okay, so I'm going to click that, and we're generating workspace. So these are the two layers on the input, two layers on the output. So that's what we've got. So on the right hand side that would be the layer names that these things are going to be. That's right. Got it. So I'm just going to move these out of the way a little bit, try and tidy up. And I'm going to put another transformer in here. And this one's called the DGN Styler. Ah. And this, we've got a bunch of different styling transformers, KML Styler, DGN, DWG. And basically they're designed to give you style options for the data out. It's basically a convenience. Those of you that are long-time FME users, you've always been able to do this, but a couple years ago we decided to wrap it up and make it even easier to do. Yeah. So what are you going to do here, Mark? I'm going to pick the cell library again. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pick a cell name, so it's oh. going to give me a list of cells in that library. Doggy Park. Yep. I would just put Dog Park, but really this you'll see the cell. It really should be called Doggy. Um, do I want to put it in shared or library? I'm going to put it in library mode. And we're going to set it to 50 units. Master units. Yes. So we can set the size. What are the other options? Master there? units or scale factor. I see. So we can scale it by a certain amount or set the master units. Yes. OK. Um, so that's going to be sales. So that's really all I need to, uh, to worry about for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Now for the polygons, I'm going to 
do the same thing. Are you going to style them too? I am. I'm going to put okay. a PGN styler on. So you select a line and then type something and it pops right into place. That's yes. pretty Sorry, I should perhaps show that again. In slow motion. Yeah. Here it is. You again, I'm rushing through this. So yeah. we select the line. I type the name of the transformer I want. If I don't know the names, we've got this transformer gallery right. that lists all of them. And there's a we'll catalog that we, we print yeah. for people. Come yes. by the booth at Autodesk University, I'll give you a catalog. Yes. So we've got all of these different um, transformers. You can drag them from here. But when you get more experienced, it's just easier to type the name in. So here we go again. So TGN Styler. I hit the return button. It's in. And it pops that transformer in there. We don't have to do any manual connections. Yes. Awesome. OK, so the yellow button just means there's some parameters we might want to check. The yellow actually means it'll run, but hey, you probably should look at it. Yeah. Red means you've got to pay attention. Yeah. So we say, well, let's color this by level, yes or no, or no, I don't want to do that. Um, the color type, I'm going to go for the color index. OK. Um, so now I can set the index number. So let's see, zero I think is, um, is, is white, and two is green, I believe. You got me. We'll find out shortly. So we can set that. We can set the line weight as well. Um, and in fact, we even get a little dialog oh, wow. that says, "What sort of line weight do you want?" So we'll just go with something fairly, fairly small, like one. Uh, it doesn't need to be uh, any thicker than that. What about styles? Um, yeah, we got styles as well. We can set the line style. So oh, wow. solid or dashed. Uh, in this case, we'll just make it solid, but um, okay. the options. that's pretty cool. And again, you've got the option to do it by level as well. Yes. And again, if you're into AutoCAD, not MicroStation, we're coming up to that in a second. Okay, so I'm just going to hit run on that one. I think the principle is that you have complete control. Yes. So if you are using FME to move data around and you think, boy, I would like to do blah, you can do it. Um, the question yes. is, what transformer or how do you, what lever do you pull? But we've tried very hard to make it possible. That's right. So what I'm doing is just starting up MicroStation now. Uh, click open. And let's see. We should have this file in here. Where's the fit button? There Whoa. we go. So we have that bunch of parks. Um, there's no fill because we don't have the fill turned on. So we'll do that. We should set it on the seed file, really. But Oh, uh, wow. There it is. There it is. And it was green. You were right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's lucky for you. <laughs> so we'll zoom in to, um, to an area down here. Now, we can't see the dog park. So what I'm going to do is, how do we oh, open, yeah. how open do we... up the layer manager? I thought it was Control-E open that up, but I could be wrong. Well, we're going to have to ask the audience out there, how do we bring up the layer manager? Uh, I was pretty sure that was... Uh, um, uh, setting. In my youth, I used to know, but uh, level. Yeah, the level display. Control, Control e. e. I'm not seeing it. It must be on your other monitor. Well, that could be the case. It might have just disappeared. So now, what can you do? Well, let's try the level manager instead. See if that pops okay. up. There we go. So I, what I just wanted to do was turn the part polygons off, because then we should be able to see. Can I do that in this case? I thought I could turn it off there. The lead is pretty harsh, but... Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so well, we always have a little... Uh, During rehearsal, this didn't happen. Yes. So let's see. Let's fit the data here. Well, we'll, we'll look at it in a view that um, doesn't have the, uh, the fill turned on, and then we'll hopefully be able to see the... Uh, the there it is. There we go. So that's a dog park, or a doggy park, because you can see that it's definitely a doggy... Um, Cell, not a dog. What a fine bit of uh, artistry there. Yeah, thank you. It, uh, it took me all of five minutes to do that. Wow. Cool. So, so there we go. That's uh, basically a cell. We can query that and okay, yeah. um, find that information. Again, the information window is probably missing on my other monitor. It's in your office right now. Very probably. OK, so we've got that. Um, what else can we do with this? We're going back to the uh, to workspace. Let's. Let's do the same thing for AutoCAD. Oh. And again, what we can do is we can say, well, let's add another writer. So this time, instead of writing DWDGM, we're going to write DWG. So there's a bunch of options there. I'll, um, you're just going to put it somewhere. But Sorry, you, you, yes, could have written, you, you could have written Map 3D with object data in it. If those, right. those, those customers out there that are Map 3D folks, we could store the attributes yes, in a first-class way. Yes, maybe I should have showed that. Uh, if I type in AutoCAD, 
you'll see we've got Autodesk 3DS, DWF, DWG, 3D object data. The various SDFs. Yeah, and uh, real DWG, a right. separate uh, thing. And Vision. Even Gina folks out yeah. there. And any, any users out there that are using Gina, you can type in right now and uh, oh, wow. we'll, we'll find out. I didn't even know what that is. So. It's uh, fabulous. It, actually, okay. City of Vancouver used to use it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was so, a vision system. Okay. okay. Oh, so we get the parameters again. We can say, well, which version do you want to write to? Or, can you yeah. even go? I think there's even more than 20, oh. 2010. Okay, 2010. The same is, as template. Yeah. And we are going to have a template. So okay. we'll see that. So I'm going to click Browse and find oh. a template because we need to do that if we want to write some blocks. Got it. Uh, presentations, CAD, it's under here. Park template, there we go. Okay. So what I did yesterday, I created the block, I put it in this template, uh, and now we're going to use that template when we write this data. Okay. Okay, so what it's saying is, would you like to add a new layer to the sample? What I'm going to say now is no. I'm I not, bet I know what you're going to do. I'm just going to copy the existing ones. You're going to duplicate these. Yes, right click and duplicate. I re to be honest, I really like that duplicate option, by the way, because okay. there's not many things that let you do that. Quite yeah. Most of them will make you do copy and paste. We do it all in one. Yeah. Thing. And then I'm just going to flip the uh, flip it over from MicroStation to AutoCAD because when we copy it by default, it's still right. going to the MicroStation output. So in here is where you can set what writer it's going to, and That's so you can right. flip things between writers even. Yes. Okay. That's what I did. Okay. So now, well, we've got the DWG styler. Let's have a look okay. at that, and we'll get the data coming out from there. So when the, when two things come out of the the dog leash, there we're basically making a copy of the feature. One goes one place and another one goes That's the other right. place. That's right, yes. And so now we can do the blocks. We need to pick the template file again. To make it know about it, yep. Because yep. you could have multiple templates floating around. Okay. That's right. It's giving us a list. Oh, there's only one. Yep. Only one block again. Okay. Park. And then you can set the size here. Set the rotation, the size, everything like that. Yep. Um, All right. And yeah, you, you can see the other options. Um, I'm not going to place a DWD style on the other one, but you, you can see we've got areas. We can fill it as an M polygon, or we can hatch it, um, just polygon without fill. Right. Um, we can set the, the pattern. Mark, can you just pull down on the rotation here? If you pull down that little thing, um, yeah, you could, you could, if there was a rotation attribute floating around it, you wanted to actually spin these things, you could. That's right. Now, yes. in our case, it doesn't make sense because we don't have a rotation, but, but you can do that, too. Yeah, yeah you could spin the, the dog around to be different rotation depending on what time it opens. Right. But that would be pretty difficult to interpret on a map. I wouldn't <laughs> like to uh, do that. Or I guess we can open the arithmetic editor if you wanted and we could sort of calculate a number based on some... Um, like the number of hours? Well, you could figure out the quadrant yeah. and say it's an early morning or a late night. That's and if true. He's, yeah. If he's upside down, that means you can only go at night or something. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we won't do that right now. I mean, it doesn't make sense with this data, but you can see, how, I hope, that um, with other data Lots of, many cases in electrical situations, I've seen it, and um, utilities that they want to, oh, wow, what's that? And we've got all the different fill patterns as well, so we can set dots and uh, Is there a special boxes. fill pattern for doggy parks? Um, there must, well, who knows? <laughs> we Gravel, could do that. grass is grass. Grass, trees, I expect. Plastic, okay. swamp. Zigzag. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to do that. This All right. Time, it's uh, fun to look at, though. Yeah. I'm just going to connect that up. So we're not going to bother styling the parks, yeah. but you've styled the the uh, points. Yeah. The reason I'm not going to style the parks is because I don't have AutoCAD installed. Ah. So I'm just not going to be able to open the data in there. Right. But I'm going to open it in the FME Viewer and have a look. So that'll prove something anyway. Yes. So we're going to hit run. I'm going to run this translation. Uh oh. Fatal error has occurred. Now, the fatal error that's occurred is the fact that I've still got the file open in MicroStation, and it's trying to overwrite it. So I'm going to close that down. It's almost as though you practiced that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's almost like I fell prey to that problem before. <laughs> Let's put it that way. In your career, you've actually seen that before? Yeah. I, you, when, if you would have scrolled up in the log file up a little bit, it would have told you the sad story. But, yes. Uh, yeah. But Mark's a veteran, so he knew what to do. So now that it's done, what are you going to do next? I'm just going to open that up in the FME Viewer just to show what we have. And so we're going to open up the DWG. Um, let's see. It was in the Vancouver Parks. And this time, I'm going to use the parameters, and we're going to expand the blocks into entities. 
and I'm going to store the insert location okay. as well. So we, yeah. we're going to get both. We're going to get entities <coughs> and we're going to get the blob. Okay. So there so we So where's are. that dog park again? Uh, well, there's a few about. I think there's one there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe we should have scaled it a bit better. Looks like our symbol's pretty darn small. Yes. But there's the uh, the symbol, uh, presumably under there as well as the, uh, the, the point. The insert point somewhere, yeah. yeah. So these all come out as... Um, yeah, the block. various pieces, because we've exploded. We've, yes. Effectively, we've dropped the block yes. so that we can view it in, in the viewer That's here. Right. And what it'll do is it will... We store that information about, well, where was the original block insert X and Y value? So, well, because the folks that are going back the other way from CAD to GIS, often they don't want to drop the block. You don't care what it looks like. Right. You just care that there was a dog there, yes. and you'll get a point in the translation. You can put yes. that out to ArcGIS or wherever, and then use your fancy symbolization on that side to do the right thing. Yes. I guess it depends if you're doing this directly to use in mapping or if you're going to use it in the GIS system or, or, or something like that. Right. Well, one of the panelists here told us that you should be using DWG Freeview, Mark. Um, there was, um, is that, is that the Autodesk one? I, I don't want to diss Autodesk, but I tried to install it yesterday, and um, it, it took a long time to download and, in, and install, and they kept throwing up things like, you've got to have this installed and that installed, and eventually I just sort of said, okay. <laughs> we won't do it. Yeah. Okay, well, anyway, we'll try that so anyway, next time. That's, yeah. I think that the SO has a free viewer, too, a 2D. Yes, but since FME's got a built-in viewer, I thought it's as good as anything. Yeah, it's, it's at least it's for our there. purposes today. Yes. Yep. So one other thing I wanted to show from this was um, a workspace that I had. Uh, let me see if it's I can find it. There we go. Cells to blocks. Oh. So yesterday, what I did was I I created the uh, the cell in MicroStation um, because I I know MicroStation and I know how to do that. But then I wanted to create a block within uh, AutoCAD out of that cell. Wow. And so this is basically what I did. I looked on our um, uh, FMEpedia. Right. So FMEpedia.com um, is a site of all the knowledge of FME. Yes. So it's a knowledge base. We've got a lot of examples there. And one of the examples I found was this workspace, which basically takes a DGN file, picks out all of the cells, explodes them into their components, and creates blocks out of them in the end. Okay. So, um, so this is just an example of what we can do. An example of FMEpedia as well. That you can download examples like this from FME. Right. And so what we do here, we read all the different geometries, we explode the data, um, et cetera, et cetera. So okay. So um, one last thing we wanted to show was. Let me go back to the previous. Um, Workspace. Oops, I opened the wrong one there. I think one end, not begin. We're getting towards the end, so that would we be are. Yes. So this is the um, uh, the workspace we basically created earlier to uh, to do um, CAD to uh, GIS, and we can say, for example, well, that was such a useful um, transformation. Maybe I want to use that again. Um, how would I how would I do that? Well, we can save the workspace. And, and use it. Yeah, and one thing that we should point out to people, and you can show them, Mark, is how if you want to run this over a different file, I've, I've seen some customers didn't yeah. realize you can double click there, yeah. and then you can just change the files or even That's select right. eight of them or whatever, and it'll just run it. So we can pick, yeah, we can pick those. You can even go in and type M star and yes. things like that. You can use wild cards and so on. So, so you, you can you can obviously change what it's going to be, but um, okay, oh wow. So, so we got, we've got an advanced browser as well. I'm doing yeah. So we can add a directory and we can say, well, look, let's look in the water folder for all DGN files. Yeah. And we'll go with that. Yes. Uh, something happened there. I'm not quite sure what. Where's our, what happened? We, MicroStation has taken over. Yeah. There it is. There We're we back. Go. Okay. So there we go. We can, we can do that. We can say, okay, look for all of the files in that folder. Yes. And that's quite a nice way to do it because you set up the workspace to read one data set, then you set it up to read a whole bunch of them all. Yes, once. that's a typical, typical thing. The other thing to do is we can click File, Save as Template. This would be if you wanted to kind of give it to your friend or something. That's and, right, yes. So, well, okay, that was um, such a useful workspace. What we're going to do is we're going to save this as a template for other people to use. And we can say it's got a category of CAD. We can set a description. 
and we can we can even bold things in there. Wow! So we got we can make bullets we've got and a things too. Bit of HTML too. in there going on, I suspect. Yeah. We can even package up the source data if we want to give that to somebody else as well. Um, Are you going to? No, today you. No, won't. I'm going to deselect that because what I really want to do is just have the reader and writer in the workspace to give that to somebody else. Right. I bet you could. Can you package up just the um, the, the cell library? I know that that isn't this case, but if you had if you're going the other yes. way, you could package up the cell yes, library. Yes, I, I could say click all files. Yes. Find the cell library. Select Tuck that. Because what this does is basically create a zip file. Right. It's, it's a no, bundle of all this stuff. Yeah. Okay. And we can set the usage and the requirements. We can set legal requirements as well if, uh, if we've got anything like that. Basically, you can wrap this nice package all up. Yes. And now you Click can mail it to button. your friend. Yep. Oh, it even tells you down here. Yep. So it tells us we save that to a, a .fmwt file. So now I can send that .fmwt file to someone. They can double-click on it. It'll pop up like this. But it'll pop up a new version based on that template. So like a Word template yes. as well. And so. the data is with it. It can be yes, if, if you want. If you want that, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I guess all you know, folks that uh, occasionally make use of our support services, this is a great way to send us what we call the repro case, yes. the reproduction case. And actually, to be honest, the beginning one might have been a better one to save as a template because then you've just got the input and the output, and you give that to somebody else, and they can add their own transformers in the middle, whether it's a neighbor finder or something right. different. Yeah. So that might have made a little bit more sense, but. But okay. either way, it's pretty good for CAD to GIS and back again to be able to have these templates. Because that means you don't have to keep creating a workspace again and again. Um, yeah, for typical scenarios that you end up encountering. That's right. Okay, well, well we're going to skip through those we slides because we did that, we did that. Um, any questions you've got, obviously, um, now's the time to... Uh, to uh, ask them. The group seems to be sweating. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to them in a few yeah, minutes and ask We'll give for them a heads up to start nominating their um, their favorite questions of the day. Mark Scott Ford, okay. he's warning me. So um, okay. okay. So now's the chance to uh, win uh, a seat in our training, if you would like. Um, so what you, if, you're, if you'd like to spend a little pre-Christmas time with yeah. Fireside with uh, Mark or someone else from our sales, or not sales team, our um, training group, you can uh, let us know if you'd be interested. And um, um, so we've got, um, yeah, we're just opening it up as a poll. And, and because all your all responses get recorded, we'll just draw 20 people at random from uh, whoever. Yeah, and so we'll be in touch very soon. I'm not sure exactly the timing, but um, okay. I think that PricewaterhouseCoopers has to audit that the draw is okay. fair. Well, so. we, we've got the answers are yes, yes, please, and no, thank you. And <laughs> so, so we're stacking it. Yeah, we should, we should give priority to people who said yes, please, and we'll fly it. So, I, don't, I don't think we'll do that. But, uh, so let's see. I just wanted to see what would happen. Yeah, there's, it's a good social experiment. So, um, yeah, okay. And we'll just leave much, it running a couple of seconds to make sure. Yeah, I think, uh, again, send in your questions. We're going to stay on the line in case I uh, don't mention it until everybody kind of uh, tires of asking us stuff, even after we wrap up the webinar in about five minutes or so. So okay. uh, feel free to keep, uh, keep asking. I okay. think that the voting is good. This. It's been that for a minute, so... Yeah, and if you want to enter later on, you can always uh, me message us if you've stepped away and you missed it. And I'll just share that so you can see how many people said yes, please, rather than yes. So not there's a makes good the... social experiment there. Yeah, it's, I very, it's a polite group, really, that yeah, we have today. Very much. So thank, thank you all. I mean, honestly, thank you so much for your interest and, and time spent with us. Um, what else do we have here? Yeah. So, yeah, we, sorry, we, we uh, you better speak. Okay. I'm, I'm babbling. Blah, blah, blah. It's, it's just not as exciting as running workbench, is it, looking it's at a, a, a slide like this. No, um, for those that don't know, this webinar was recorded um, live in front of a studio audience here in the Crystal Gondola in Surrey. And so um, we'll be sending you an email so you can replay this uh, yep. later on. And um, you can learn more about our stuff by looking at our desktop free trial. We are always happy to give you more of a demo relating to your scenario. If you have a particular CAD JS situation that you'd like us to, to look at, we're pleased to do that. And we have the introduction to FME Desktop webinar. Um, that's uh, more of a basic sort of level uh, of things. If, if you saw something today and you like the look of it but weren't sure quite how we did it, then yes. probably the webinar. We've also got tutorials online with movies. Um, you can look through those as well. But all that stuff will be coming at them in an email. Um, that's right. 
fair, fairly soon. Yes. And oh, well, that's tutorials and training. There must be some webinars coming up as well. I don't. This might be the last one before Christmas, or is there another one? I don't know. We don't know. But so, if we could go online to look at safe.com, I think that uh, I think for Mark and I, it's our last one before it's Christmas. It's last one for a while, yes. So, um, but in the new year, I know we've got a bunch coming up on things like using FME with ArcGIS more productively, um, using FME with things like PDF. I know that's planned. Uh, XML, XML, yes. Don Murray will be um, coming in the door here telling me to promote the XML one if I'm not careful. And there's training next week on FME and... Oracle. Oh, FME yes. and Oracle training That's coming next up. Week, so yes. if you're an Oracle person, yeah, I'm sure you could still uh, find a way to get into yeah. that. And FME and Esri in early December. Okay. Oh, okay. FME and Esri in early December. So it's a busy uh, calendar yeah. coming up, uh, coming up here for sure. And if you're in Germany, you can come to FME Days. There's a two-day, actually a whole week conference, but two days of actual conference, a whole week event in Germany. Um, the first week, right after Autodesk University. So if you hang out in Munster. You can you can do that. Yeah, and you'll be over there. I'll be there. Don will be there. And Safe Luminaries, Europeans, Ken Bragg and Dean Hintz yes. joining us there as well. So it should be a great uh, great yeah. gathering. So should we? Um, Did you have any good questions, then, Mark? To uh, let's see. Well, how so come? Robot. How come your DWG had a coordinate had coordinate systems, and that's because it had that PRJ PRJ file. So normally it wouldn't. Normally you have to pick it. I still like to tell this quick story about how a customer called me years ago and I used to do support. And he said um, he'd only used Map Info all his life. So every Map Info file he'd ever seen, of course, had a coordinate system. He had a DWG file. He phoned me up and said, "FME is no good. It's not picking up the coordinate system." Mm -hmm. it took me several times to go round and round to say, "Well, there is no coordinate system in the DWG file. There just isn't. Uh, it's not there. It's just not. That's the way the universe is." And then he paused and said. Well, this is going to be a problem, um, and probably a very profound answer for many, many of you. But a lot of formats don't have that, and a, a lot of them we try and give some sort of support for it with Word files, PRJ files, or, or similar. Yes. So there were some a, uh, questions about XFM and D, DGN files. i um, show that. What do you got for us there, Mark? Well, I don't have any data, but we do have... If you just type XFM. Yeah, see, I thought we'd... XFM. You must have too old of a build. Oh, that's interesting. I thought it was. I thought I got a. Well, anyway, it's breaking news. But if you type that, if you go to safe.com/beta, yeah, there would it's called that, so it's called Bentley. Um, it did get added to 2012. I know that, and I thought I'd got it late. It's I, in the I, last I, couple of days that it went in. Right. So I guess my build's not quite new enough. Right. But anyway, there is a, an XFM reader that. Some, I was actually on the phone with some of my colleagues from or friends from Bentley yesterday um, that filled me in on some of the plans there. But it, that reader that we've got should do a basic job for folks. Yes. Um, and if you're determined to write, you can write, but probably not create. So in other words, you can go XFM to XFM making changes along the way. But it'd be right at this point, if you're starting from shape and going to XFM, I think that we're in a bit over our head. Okay. But uh, But reading is okay and I know my Bentley friends tell me that they're actually modifying how they're doing XFM so their new release coming out later next year will have to do some revising there okay. but the good news in the, is there's eight years worth of XFM data we should be able to at least read. Okay. Good. Okay. Con Con yeah. Sorry. Go ahead Mark. Converting symbology from a layer? layer file or an MXD? Um, we both take a deep breath. Yeah. That's, <laughs> huh. Well. Um, we do have an MXD reader. Yes. So, um, and actually, I think there's even an LYR. Oh, is there? Well, let's see if that one's here. Yeah. Oh, no. no I don't think there is. I thought there was. There is? Oh, OK. <laughs> we can't find that either. Well, so, there's definitely an MXD reader. Um, and we can read that information. Yes, so what happens there is that we will read and somewhat apply the styling rules to give out things like primarily color. Um, so we're not doing much more than that currently, but at least you can get the color. Uh, is that fair to say, Mark? Um, and that's sort of a, a quest that I have just to figure out how we can add more value for folks um, to read out other things from that uh, with time, but at least right now you can get the color. I mean, is there even a standard specification for symbology? That's one of the issues. Yeah. And so actually, um, at SAFE, we're looking at something like Cardo. If uh, some of you have heard of um, Mapnik, it has a styling language called Cardo, which we think that might be an interesting model for a universal okay. styling language. And so in that case, we would go underneath the covers in FME from ArcGIS MXD to Cardo, 
and then from Cardo out to DGN or whatever. That that's I'm talking about like a, you know a three year research plan. But um, but anyway, great minds are thinking about it even as we speak right now. Good. And I think this other one is PLS CAD. That's right. PLS CAD is a transmission design tool. So quite a few requests for that. We have worked with it before. So contact support if you want to pursue that a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. So is that an XML thing ultimately, Mark? Yeah. It is. And you love XML as well? Not as much. <laughs> But he, but he can get the job done. Um, for those that don't know, there must be an XML webinar that's been recorded at least one. There's probably several of them. Um, I know we did one on SIM and multi-speak and XML, but just XML in general. And I know that there's a two-parter being planned for next year. Yes. It's, uh, it's like a to-be-continued, like almost a mini-series yes. um, that Don is excited about doing. Yes. So, um, so those are some good questions, yeah. And if you have others that we didn't touch on, please come in. I see we've hit the top of the hour. So in uh, Eastern... United States, it's time for lunch. Yes. Here, it's barely even time for breakfast yet. It's safe anyway. Right. Um, but um, but I think probably that's about it. You can see our contact info there. You can follow us on Twitter as well. Safe Software, FME Doctors, uh, Mark Two at Safe. Is that who you are? Uh, FME Evangelist. FME Evangelist. Is, uh, better one. Yeah. yeah, that's a fun one to to follow. Yeah. Um, I tweet usually only at conferences. Dale at Safe. Mm -hmm. If you want to hear or see what I think about things at Autodesk University next week, you can tune in there. And um, I think probably we'll wrap up. Yeah, so just a big thank you to everyone for turning up this morning and, um, and tuning in. Yes. It was great to be here, great to, uh, great to have this opportunity. I hope you learned something from it. Yes, thank yeah. you so, so much. Um, I also want to thank the SAFE team that was busy typing away. I saw the keyboards were fairly warm there as uh, mm -hmm. stuff was flying back and forth. And we do look over the uh, questions and answers afterwards and we'll get back to you if, <clears throat> if we weren't able to quite answer your stuff uh, at the time. So with that, we are going <clears> to, <throat> my voice is going, so that's a good <laughs> sign that we should that's stop. So. We'll call that it. Thanks so much. Enjoy your Thanksgiving. Um, we will close the webinar, but let the questions keep on flowing until th stuff dies down. Um, oh, wait a minute, I see that there's 99% that have gone, only 1%. So the 1% is who's left, if I believe that. No, that's, um, that, that's different. That's like what percentage of the audience can see the updated screen. Okay, so well, now it's 100% that can't or something. Yeah, so whenever, whenever it says 100% can't see the screen, then you know you've lost your internet connection. Okay, so, wow. So uh, Now they're back. All right, so I won't try to interpret those uh, results. Uh, now that 100% of them are back, so that's good. Thank okay. you so much again, and we'll call that good. We won't close it all the way off, but we will shut off the broadcast. And uh, that's it from Surrey, okay. home of the soon-to-be Grey Cup, BC Lions practice facility. A lot of folks don't know that. Absolutely. Thanks, folks. Bye.